All right. We are recording. Okay, cool. So I'm with uh, Michael today. How are you, Michael? I'm great, Sonny. How are you? I am well. I'm well. It's been, uh, oh, it's, I guess it's always busy, you know, um, so nothing, nothing new there, I guess. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm well. I'm, I'm excited about our call. I wanted to, uh, you know, just maybe start by, I usually start off by where did we meet first? Um, you know, I guess uh, that probably was more recently, right? Through, I don't know, it feels like just through, uh, through some of the projects I'm involved with. Um, I think Shift was, uh, I think it was something Shift related, right? Maybe uh, we might have ran into each other sometime in Toronto. I spent quite a bit of time there in the past. But Were you at the events? We... I, yeah, because you do look quite familiar. I feel like I've, I've seen you before around as well. I've been Toronto's... on a few. Yeah, I went to F Waterloo way back and spent some time in Toronto. Um, I went to uh, one of the Aeon events. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, back then and, I, I, and yeah. just generally. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know Matt and those guys as well. So cool. Interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining me today. I wanted to uh, maybe just dive into it. Like I was saying, you know, to you earlier is that I like to, um, I like to uh, learn about people's stories, um, you know, more than even uh, anything else, really more than even, you know, at NGU or whatever, all time highs, all that stuff is uh, interesting, but less so. I think the uh, the stories behind the people and then obviously the tech, right? So so where does your story begin, Michael? Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to, to, to set the context for crypto, uh, mm. I should probably go back to where I was born, which was in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born there, but raised in the U.S., moved to moved to the U.S. when I was about two years old. So I am generally known as the as, as the gringo in my family. But Nonetheless, uh, I really love the culture and, 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 and love being from there. Um, uh, and then fast forward a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess my first uh, foray into finance or learning about finance was through Occupy Wall Street in, in 2008. Uh, didn't, <laughs> Interesting. Didn't, yeah. didn't participate super deeply, but definitely uh, learned a lot about mm. the financial system uh, during that time. And, and then from there, I, I started working at, at a credit union, selling mm. uh, uh, credit card loans and car loans and that kind of thing for a couple of years. So I looked at hundreds, if, if not maybe even over a thousand credit reports. And, and that probably further uh, kind of set me up for, for when I discovered Bitcoin in, in, in 2013. Um, I, had remember, I remember reading a, a Wired article uh, about the Silk Road mm. and uh, just became fascinated by, by, by Bitcoin and, and, and what it was doing or what it was enabling, to be honest, and ended up on the subreddit, uh, the Bitcoin subreddit at the time, and just absolutely fell in love uh, with the space. Uh, I remember buying my first Bitcoin when, when, when it was around $600, mm. uh, late 2013 on Coinbase. And from there, uh, uh, just progressively bought up to 1200 and then bought all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> all the way down to to, to eighteen hundred or, or to to two hundred dollars or whenever it, whenever it was. So, you know, that's kind of that was kind of my my initial uh, uh, foray into crypto and and really when I really fell in love with it, just because I had really, you know, I sent money via Western Union to my family, had felt that pain, and then mm. alongside working at the bank account or at the credit unions at the time, just seeing the kind of difficulties of of the current financial system, and also I think you know having played so many video games from like. Neopets to RuneScape to World of Warcraft. Uh, I also think I felt pretty comfortable with this idea of of digital money at the time. Mm. So, um, you know, uh, uh, have a pretty yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say let's let's maybe just pause there. That that story really, I mean, just just the initial part of it really resonates with me because uh, I agree, man. That's the rem you touched on remittance. You touched on you know Occupy Wall Street. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I fundamentally agree with kind of what they were proposing or whatever as a solution, but that definitely jarred me as well initially in terms of like, and I think, but I sometimes wonder why was that, you know, what, what it was, it probably was probably the first time right in our lives that we had seen, um, I don't know, protests, I guess, on that scale, uh, somewhere so close to home, maybe that, I don't know if that was it. And, um, but yeah, I remember too, I remember in Toronto, they were even taking place and I had, you know, I was just, I was curious about what these people were, were, were talking about and, and, uh, cool. 
Cool. So, 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 wait, so I was, I wanted to drill in on a little bit though, on that Bitcoin thing. So when you said you discovered Bitcoin, it really resonated, but curious, like how, what kind of, from the, from the Occupy Wall Street statement and the remittance, but like to kind of tie it into Bitcoin, how, how was it that you, you, you kind of saw this connection? Did you read the white paper? Were you just going to meetups or like, yeah, how you... mm. I read, I read the white paper, um, uh, and really didn't get any of it. I, I wasn't really technical <laughs> or, or a developer at the time. Uh, I remember listening to Andreas's uh, podcasts at the time, Andreas Antonopoulos, and obviously, I think I think a lot of us owe our entry into crypto to to Andreas generally. Mm. Um, I remember just feeling so inspired and motivated uh, uh, about about crypto and, and everything that was possible. Right, I remember doing some presentations about about Bitcoin at the time and just broader blockchain, uh, kind of the possibilities, you know. Mm. Um, uh, to, 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 you know, in Dominican Republic at some of the universities there, for example. And, and for me, it was just trying to wrap my head around how it worked. Mm. Um, I know I had been trying to break in in tech at the time, uh, had tried to really start a bunch of businesses and never really, uh, nothing really ever panned out. And, uh, I just really tried hard to understand it. Um, even if I wasn't able to contribute to the Bitcoin core, core code base, um, uh, and, and, and just really, started to, you know, drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, I really got it. I felt like at the time and, and, and saw this idea of, of a money system that was completely separate from what we were used to, right? The fact that I could send my cousins Bitcoin almost instantly uh, 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 over the internet uh, was just mind blowing to me. Uh, you know, mm. I remember paying them for, for lunches in Dominican Republic and, and, and that whole thing when I was trying to explain it to them. And um, yeah, just, just that experience of, of, you know, having someone, I think at the time I was using the blockchain.com wallet, and just having people people download that and say, hey, let me just send you some Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, I was just absolutely obsessed. Uh, to be honest, after after um, after that kind of mid 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 twenty six or twenty thirteen time frame, more than more than anything. And then the culture of the subreddit. I mean, by that at that time, there hadn't really been um, uh, much movement towards Twitter yet. Uh, before the kind of Thamos, you know, all that happened, but. Uh, <laughs> But, but back then it was just, you know, for me, Bitcoin talk and, and mm. the Bitcoin subreddit uh, was never too active or anything like that. I might've had one or two posts on Bitcoin talk, but, but just generally, you know, viewing everything and, and, and just looking at the history, you know, seeing like Satoshi's like writings pop up every once in a while was, was just super fascinating. And, and, you know, I've generally always been uh, uh, someone comfortable with, with, like I said before, with kind of these digital assets, right. Having, you know, you know, like seeing these swords and wow, for example, being valuable to me for, for no reason other than, mm. you know, makes my character more powerful, right? Just, it just felt natural, right? Uh, now how that sat in the global financial system and monetary system, <laughs> that was, that was all over my head at the time. Mm. It still, still is frankly, but, you know, for me, it was just, you know, the separate system that was interesting. It was an experiment and I, I just was completely just compelled by it, right? Um, uh, many, yeah, and many I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how many other young people around the world, or old people, or people, just have this beautiful, like peaceful kind of like problem solving interaction with Bitcoin, you know, as their first, uh, as their first, um, you know, interaction with it. So that, that I think that's a mar that that's a great uh, beginning to the story. So curious, so what happens then? So you're you're hodling, you're you're buying some Bitcoin, you're you're creeping Bitcoin uh, talk, uh, you know, <laughs> um, posts and all that. You're you're doing your you're doing your thing, and then and then how do you um, you know? And, and curious, I mean, just to, just to point out, like I call these Bitcoin stories, but if you go to building on Bitcoin. Com, it takes you to kind of the YouTube channel. And um, one of my main themes is, is uh, the things that one of the things I'm most like kind of um, grateful for is that not only does Bitcoin, you know, amazing in the sense that it's like uh, you can, you know, it goes up in value because it's deflationary and blah, blah, blah. But you can also devote, you know, more time and effort to this industry and actually kind of build a career out of it as well, right? And so, you know, whether it's like authors or, I don't know, entrepreneurs or professors, I mean, I'm trying to like, you know, just get different looks at it. So curious, how does your journey progress from there? Yeah, so, so like I said, I've been trying to break, break into tech for a while. And, mm. and um, I actually, just to, to take it back a couple more years, uh, I ended up, uh, so I, I went, started going to university for, for a business degree. 
ended up um, failing out because I was playing too much WoW and, and smoking too much pot at the time. <laughs> and 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 uh, during that time, that's when I was working at golf courses and, and the credit union and the whole thing. And I'd mm. just been trying to do like marketing, business development, blogging. Had I remember like I had I had a bunch of random ideas. I tried applying to accelerators and mm. various things, and never never got accepted or anything like that. Um, and from there, uh, uh, it wasn't until 2014 when I really started to feel like I could contribute in a meaningful way to this technology and started to really think that I could work in, in, in crypto or at the time it was Bitcoin in full time. Uh, and that's because I had tried to get an app built uh, that was actually a fantasy sports application, uh, mm. actually something I'm, I'm a big sports fan and, and, and was trying to build this app and ended up hiring someone off of Reddit to, to build this, this you know, full stack application. He ended up just building us an, an empty front end. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, uh, I was like, "Wow, okay, this doesn't really work." Basically, burned like three or four thousand dollars, and uh, that's kind of what motivated me to to learn to code. Uh, uh, actually, more than anything, uh, and uh, at the time, I finally started wrapping up university. Ended up graduating in, in 2015 after about seven or eight years, and I was at the time just trying to break into iOS development. Um, so that kind of um, prepped me for, for Ethereum down the road uh, uh, in late 2016. But I remember at, actually, I remember going to the Bitcoin Miami conference in, in 2014, because I'm, I'm here in Tampa, Florida. And I remember watching Vitalik announce uh, Ethereum in the con. It, it, in, I was there in the crowd watching Vitalik announce it. I was like, oh, this is, this is vaporware. At the time, I was just like 100% um, mm. uh, thinking Bitcoin was, was going was, was gonna to be everything at the time. And uh, for me, it wasn't until late 2016 uh, when I really started to think about uh, uh, diving into the space full time. Uh, I, I was an iOS developer, I had been an iOS developer for about two and a half, three years and started writing smart contracts on Ethereum. And, and that's really when uh, my mind was blown because I, you know, a simple you know, self-taught software developer like me could actually build something interesting. Uh, whereas previously, you know, contributing to, to Bitcoin, you know, core's code base was just, you know, out of reach for me, at least at the time. Uh, so for the first time, I really felt empowered to be able to build something myself uh, in the space. And, and having tried to build a bunch of applications before, the paradigm of, of, of smart contracts felt very familiar through object-oriented programming and, and that whole thing. And, and that's when I really started uh, to dig deep into, um, into building smart contracts and, and eventually coming across pocket, but, but even before then, just, just the idea of being able to deploy this, this smart contract and having anyone, anyone use it was just absolutely mind blowing to me. And it was just, it really crystallized uh, a lot of the belief uh, and, and, and kind of ideal, uh, idealist part of, of crypto for me and Bitcoin at the time that, that, that really just got me so excited about what was possible. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And that's, that's a very common, I mean, a lot of people, you know, have a similar type of um, experience, right? Where they find these limitations in Bitcoin. And, and if I had to try and like, kind of, you know, put it in, let's say normal words or whatever, like Bitcoin can be somewhat, I, I think Vitalik used this quote, right? I, I don't know how accurate it is. I'm sure I'm going to get roasted for it, but like he said something along the lines that that kind of made sense to me um, is that Bitcoin is more like a calculator and, you know, whereas Ethereum was more like, you know, like a, a computer where you could essentially execute code or whatever, right? Um, but, but just curious, like when you say though that, 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 that it just, you know, it was just like about just uh, contributing to core and that was really the end of it. Um, uh, is that what you're referring to? Is just like the programmability aspect of, of Bitcoin and how you couldn't really build anything on top of it. It was, you could either contribute to what Bitcoin is today but you know you couldn't do more than that is that what you meant yeah so the way i describe it is it's like when i learned to code for ios right i had tried to learn to code probably eight, eight or nine times before that and nothing had ever stuck and it wasn't until apple released a programming language called swift back in 2015 mm. that uh, maybe even maybe it was 2014 that things really stuck because for me and this is very simple and, and silly but to be able to just drag and drop a button with an empty code block and have the software called Xcode be able to generate just a little bit of code just to see how things work and how uh, uh, various parts of your applications are connected, you know, and eventually to the internet. Uh, I like to think that Ethereum did something similar for blockchain development generally by, you know, taking something that was just incredibly complex and, and having 
to really you know have a deep understanding and knowledge of of, of how things worked at a technical level to to be able to contribute to all of a sudden allowing um, uh, really anyone with programming experience to be able to um, uh, you know build something on Ethereum and it's it's definitely not nor is it today uh, you know drag and drop nor probably will will it be for a while uh, and of course you know this you know lowering of the of the barrier. Uh, uh, has its upsides and downsides, right? Which we've seen, you know, over the years with all the hacks and, and exploits and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's created, in my opinion, an explosion of, of people building, right? Um, and and you know, uh, again, like I said, that comes with its with its with its downsides. But but for me, the the, the net positive for the world has uh, has far surpassed that, in, in my view. Interesting, interesting. Um... Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just curious. So just on that point, though, because I think it's an important one, you know, that people sometimes gloss over. And then I was like you, too, by the way, I, I, I definitely did not get in on the Ethereum bandwagon early on. And to some extent, even to this day, I'm, I'm like I said, I consider myself a bit of a Bitcoin maximalist. But I do recognize that, you know, Ethereum, I mean, you can't deny it. Right. I mean, what's happened over the last few years, whether you love it or hate it. It has attracted, um, you know, programmers. It has attracted, you know, it, see, innovation is messy, right? You know what I mean? Like innovation isn't always like, you know, you just figure it out on the first go. Um, but I do think that it's created, it's given people um, the ability to, you know, like it's like WordPress, like you said, or, or not WordPress, but like drag and drop, like visual oriented programming. And like, just by lowering that bar, um, like creating a Swiss army knife type of thing uh, on top of something like a blockchain. He, he kind of, cre you know, enabled a lot of that to happen. Um, in kind of, I guess, in retrospect, though, you know, with the fees and everything, like it could be argued that, you know, like a lot of this was, you know, to some extent foreseeable, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, but at the same time, um, I wonder, do you think there's a room, like, things like RSK and all that, is it even mildly interesting to people like you? Or do you think the boat has sailed now for innovating on top of Bitcoin and making it more programmable, right? Because I have interviewed a lot of those guys as well. Yeah, no, I definitely don't think the boat has sailed on that front. And, hmm. and I myself am a big fan of, of RSK and, and what they're doing and, and Blockstack as well. Hmm. I think, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a million experiments happening and, and we'll see uh, uh, which ones succeed and which ones don't. Um, I think in the end, um, you know, this is a pretty free market. I think in the end, the market will decide what, uh, what succeeds and what doesn't. Um, I like to think that um, things that are generally much more censorship resistant will win, although one could tell a bunch of stories that, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, in 10, 20 years, we have a world, you know, where, you know, you've got 10, 20, you know, major kind of node providers between exchanges and kind of these large operations kind of controlling everything. And, and for me, things like RSK and, and, and Blockstack to some extent, and, you know, in my view, many, uh, uh, uh many types of different kinds of protocols are, are kind of, in that vision, um, if I were to say that the majority aren't, uh, uh, at least at least in my view, um, but but generally, um, I think it's great. Uh, I, I think you know, it, I, I think Bitcoin is, is is obviously has made it more difficult, right? So and that's that's by design in my view, and I think that's a good thing. Um, so so I think as the Bitcoin technology improves to make it easier for people to build on top of RSK, block stack, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think there's plenty of space for that. It was, it was funny because it's like it's, it's censorship resistance is was used as the reason to why to not allow smart cat contract capability to some extent, right? But then it's censorship resistance that's essentially being used on the flip side, right? Because of, you know what I'm saying or no? <laughs> like RSK no, you... <laughs> and all of them are centralized, essentially, yeah. is the argument against them. Um, but Bitcoin is decentral, right? Decentralized. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is, is that it's funny how like Bitcoiners or Bitcoin like core developers, or whatever, they kind of tried to preserve Bitcoin's uh, decentralized nature. And that's why they didn't, let's say, allow people like Vitalik or whatever people who want to create the capability. Sure. You, you know what I'm saying? There's like a nuance there. But I agree with you. The free market speaks for itself. And at the end of the day, um, people will choose, right? What what makes the most amount of sense. And uh, uh, but I think what, what's happening here, though, is, is that the level of decentralization 
at what point is it that you yep. need it type of deal. You know what I mean? Like for money as a base layer, you probably need something that is super decentralized um, type of deal. Whereas an exchange or if you're building something like that, maybe you don't, but then where's that, that, you know, fine balance, like you said, free market, people will tell us at the end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we're going to start to see a natural kind of um, as you go higher up the stack, right. Mm. It's, it's likely to become, you know, less decentralized in some ways. Uh, uh, hmm. uh, I, I think you know if you can lump RSK, Liquid, and 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 Blockstack in kind of the same bucket, mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. I think they're doing what they can to to at least in the most part to to work within the the the, the constraints of, of Bitcoin, right? Um, and and that's okay. And and who's to say there isn't going to be um, some improvement or some technology that 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 helps actually make it significantly more censorship resistant, at least at the layers on top of Bitcoin as well. Um, and that's Got one of the things that, that I appreciate, um, you know, that, that, that Ethereum has done, I believe is, is even on the kind of layer two level, um, uh, at least a couple of projects have really made an intention to, to, to remove kind of a basic multi-sig <laughs> as, as, uh, masquerading as, as, as decentral, uh, you know, as censorship persistent or, or decentralized or, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think as a lot of these, you know, ZK technologies start to, you know, materialize and, and improve and, and we start to see it in, in practice, I, I think a lot of that will apply to, to, to Bitcoin based layer twos as well. Cool. So anything else on, I guess, Bitcoin and, and your story more specifically that you wanted to share before we maybe move on? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I guess I've always, uh, 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 you know, consider my Bitcoin is always, you made an interesting comment about um, Bitcoin being a calculator and, and, and Ethereum being, I think, a, a computer, I think is mm. what you said. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't view it like that. Uh, mm. um, personally, I, I suppose I would view it more as like Bitcoin being something like TCP or, or, or HTTPS, mm. probably, probably more like TCP as kind of like, like as just a core building block. And, and I kind of, you know, mm. Uh, view it as as these other protocols just solving very different problems, right? Um, and we're starting to see kind of a proliferation of of different blockchains and you know smart contracts on, on top of these layer ones, uh, however you want to call it, um, just solving these these other very specific problems, right? Uh, but but it's, in my view, I, I view it more as a as a frankly complementary thing, right? Um, whether the experiment of of this decentralized computer works or not, right? Um, you know, that's, that's an open question. I think it's pretty clear that, that, that Bitcoin is, is, you know, it's not quite like what it was in, in 2013 and 2014, where, it, you know, we'd watch a, a government hearing and, and, and you'd get like a positive what set of words from a, from, and everyone would just be like, yeah, so <laughs> or an exchange would go down and, uh, and like, yeah. you know, it's like so yeah. susceptible to everything. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's kind of taking yeah. a life of its own. Okay. So, so you, you, you kind of touched on uh ethereum a bit but just curious then so i guess how did things uh for you kind of shift more towards uh what you're doing today yeah yeah so so like i mentioned uh i was i was working at a startup in in late 2016 and uh, started to get pretty the solution from a startup we probably need another hour and a half to talk about my experiences there but <laughs> basically um we learned a lot about what not to do Mm. Uh, uh, as, uh, in, in terms of creating a company and, um, started experimenting, you know, this was after the Dow hack, um, uh, you know, at the time, you know, ETH was, you know, no one was really, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, belief in ETH was, was, I think, at a, at, a, at an all time low at the time. And, you know, we just started experimenting my co-founders and I, uh, we're, we're four people, um, uh, uh, you know, three Dominicans and a Colombian, uh, who started pocket and, started playing around with smart contracts. Uh, the first idea that we started to play around with was, was something called Tailcoin. And the idea was being able to travel to Paris on my, um, you know, and, and be able to buy and sell data on the same uh, frequencies of, of, of cell phone providers. We had this idea where we could incentivize people to um, basically build their own cell towers through these, these, these vehicles called MVNOs. Uh, mobile virtual network operators. And our view was that at the time was because of the anti uh, kind of uh, monopoly laws here in the US, uh, people like Verizon and AT&T would be forced to rent uh, their, their, their tower data uh, to, to companies like ours. And uh, we'd be able to come up with a more efficient system using these kind of crazy, you know, crypto economic, you know, ideas and, and so on and so forth, but, but ended up thinking or seeing through that process um, 
uh, really ended up, we kind of stumbled across pocket uh, in, in that capacity uh, uh, where we saw that this kind of core infrastructure was, was much more needed at the time than, and much more possible, to be honest, um, than, than kind of this, this kind of telcoin kind of idea. So uh, uh, we ended up uh, uh, using an infrastructure provider that's, that's quite well known in the Ethereum space called Infura. And, and as 2017 rolled along, we really saw the importance of Infura for Ethereum and uh, the reliance that Ethereum uh, frankly still has uh, in many ways on, on Infura. Uh, I think at the time, upwards of 80% of all traffic was going through this uh, centralized infrastructure provider. So, you know- Can view, you explain what Infura is just a little bit? Because I, I know you and I know it is, but I know there's a lot sure. of people out there that are kind of getting into this space. And, and I know that's kind of the, like you said, one of the big criticisms about Ethereum, right? Is, is the yeah. fact that it relies heavily on Infura. So I yeah. do like the fact that you guys are addressing one of you know the biggest criticisms. So so yeah, but but you're curious, how can you yeah kind of just break yeah. that one down? So, so when I refresh any uh, wallet application and and it shows me my balance, um, uh, that when I refresh it, it creates a a request over HTTPS, and that goes over to some server somewhere uh, that's almost always owned by one entity. Let's use Coinbase as an example. Uh, when I see my balance on Coinbase, Coinbase is running a bunch of Bitcoin nodes to be able to provide that balance for my wallet, right? So in between uh, uh, the, the application itself, so my mobile you know, Coinbase app, uh, you have this centralized company that is uh, providing access to Bitcoin full nodes. So uh, this, and this is, this really goes back to kind of the traditional development paradigm that, that the world is in today, where it's this kind of client server model where you have an application that is making requests for information, in this case, a balance of my Bitcoin wallet, for example, and reaching all the way down to um, a Bitcoin full node, right? Uh, and and uh, 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 in every case, uh, there is a centralized company uh, providing uh, uh, the access to these full nodes specifically, right? And and that's in our, in completely, in, in complete agreement, uh, you, we have these, centralized networks or decentralized networks, but with these centralized kind of choke points. And, and in my view, you know, I, I see a world where we're going to be living in a stack of various decentralized technologies, whether it's, you know, DNS for handshake or storage for Sciacoin or Filecoin or whatever, you know, uh, digital gold with, with Bitcoin and, 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 and whatnot. And, um, we have yet to get to these other layers of the stack, right. Uh, critically. Um, and, and part of our efforts is, is, and what we discovered was, was this is an important, uh, kind of choke point for kind of the future of, in our view, crypto generally blockchains, generally, whether Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or, or doesn't really matter. And, um, it's something that needed to be done in our view. And, and, uh, so that's when we started kind of thinking about the problem in, in a meaningful way. And, and to give you a, a concrete example, uh, Coinbase, uh, actually came into existence, uh, because of the. UX improvement of at, at the trade-off of centralization for um, uh, uh, them running the full nodes for their users. In fact, you know, back in 2011, 2010 timeframe, you had to run Bitcoin Core, right? You had your Bitcoin wallet, uh, 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 and and you had to be fairly technical to be able to do that, right? Coinbase's bet was, hey, let's remove this pain for the end user right by quite literally having us run the bitcoin node by providing you that data now all of a sudden we switch from what we believe the new paradigm should be to the old paradigm where we're trusting coinbase to provide and show us data to our applications and every single wallet DeFi application doesn't matter is mm -hmm. all under that paradigm today and and that's kind of what we stumbled upon and and discovered uh, uh in the process of of, of building pocket and really the big goal here was to decentralize that part of the stack uh, quite literally where you have true uh, permissionless and decentralized access to, to full nodes for people building applications on, on blockchains more than anything. Fascinating. I 100% agree. Yeah, yes. And by the way, the company that I founded, Unocoin, were some, for better or worse, considered to be a Coinbase of India, meaning we, I mean, December 2013, Hey, can you mind if I pause this? I, I don't know. Can you can you pick up the the, the bait crying baby in the upstairs? 
I just heard it just now. I heard it. <laughs> that, I had, that was a loud one. I might have to. I might have to do an intervention here. Uh, you know, but but I'll see. I think it's quieted down a bit. Um, sure. Yeah, I know mommy's uh, not feeling so well this week, so I gotta gotta yeah, a lot going on here. Um, no problem. <clears throat> But I was going to ask you, so, so no, I agree with you, I think. And, and so even Unocoin, so for example, there are a lot of companies that use services like Bitco, you know, about yep. Bitco. Yes. Of course. Right. And so, um, so, so and I agree with you that, that, that providing that node is, or that node service is unfortunately, unfortunately kind of led to the centralization of uh, this industry to, to a large extent. Right. And so what you're saying is, is that Pocket embarked upon this journey to essentially decentralize um the nodes <laughs> that's exactly right that's exactly right centralize all the nodes okay to allow anyone to be able to run a full node and and uh, so talk to me about how can i participate if i so i'm like okay whoa hold on wait uh, so now you're telling me that i can host a big wait but not bitcoin node it, it wouldn't we be a bitcoin node we support Bitcoin, actually. So, so, so you're saying uh, I could be supporting the Bitcoin network and the Ethereum network and the whatever network I choose by buying what a Mac Mini or like a Raspberry Pi. No, I mean like how do how does one partake? Okay, you're getting me excited here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's uh, so so let's say you're running a Bitcoin full node, right? Uh, historically, and this has been a common issue where as these blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum become significantly more difficult. Uh, more expensive to host, right? Like you used to be able to host, you know, a, 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 an Ethereum node or a Bitcoin node on your laptop super easily, mine, so on and so forth. Um, not anymore. Uh, uh, in fact, 99% of everything is, is hosted in the cloud. So not only are there just a couple of companies uh, running, um, you know, hosting most of these full nodes at this time, uh, but they're also on service providers uh, like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, and so on and so forth. Our claim is that you can run a full node, uh, put pocket in front of it and start earning our native cryptocurrency for providing data to applications who need data from that Bitcoin node, right? And, and that's what we've built. And, and uh, the important part about this is it's uh, very much in the vein of a verify, don't trust, um, uh, because in this case, applications can verify uh, the data that they're receiving from these Bitcoin nodes. And this is what allows Pocket to be truly permissionless is, is we don't pick and choose who gets to run a Bitcoin node. Everyone has the same kind of uh, capability of, of providing data to applications. Um, you asked about Raspberry Pis, right? Um, it's not quite that. Uh, uh, it really depends on, on, on your hardware and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, if, if it's enough to, to host a Bitcoin node, then, then, then you're good to go. Uh, the pocket software side of things is not very uh, cumbersome. So, so it's really quite simply run a Bitcoin node, run pocket in front of it. And that's what allows. I have a question. How big is the Bitcoin uh, database now or whatever? Like if I want to, yeah. I mean, I, it's been a while since I did that. It's, it's uh, like personally, 400 I gigabytes. I think it's around 400 gigs. I think. Okay. So I uh, could don't, foreseeably, don't quote me on that. I could foreseeably but, go buy a one ter. I mean, a one terabyte, um, whatever hard drive isn't that expensive, but I could go foreseeably go buy one of those and connect it to my Raspberry Raspberry Pi, uh, get a Bitcoin node up and running, right, and then get somehow connected the Pocket network. And for companies like Coinbase and Unocoin, maybe not them because they're already got it figured out, but like companies like that that are looking to offer. I don't know. I, I guess I'm trying to figure this out. Like, is it like a replacement of Bitco or kind of sort of, is it like also wallet infrastructure? Or is it just the nodes? Is it, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so every wallet needs a full node. Uh, right. Uh, every, every blockchain has its quirks, right? So there are kind of various uh, uh, kind of bespoke solutions that centralized companies have, have had to do uh, to basically ensure, you know, quick service and, and these sorts of things. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 really that simple, and that and that's our claim is is being able to spin up a node at home uh, uh, in a local data center, and uh, uh, you know in that same hard drive, you know put Pocket in it, and all of a sudden be able to start uh, uh, answering requests for data from applications built on Pocket. And in fact, Coinbase they use Infura uh, for for some of their products, right? And even Binance um, uses Infura for some of the for for their exchange. Um, so, so this isn't limited to just kind of any application. Everyone really uses. But, but these what is Infura? Like, what's the 
what's the like what is it called like what, what is it like when people so, refer to it it's so like they're a, they're they're an api uh basically so so um uh they all are they, they're the ones that allow application developers to mm. trans to to request and receive the data for their users balances so you know if i build a wallet that has a thousand users and i have that on my phone i need to be able to send that request for my balance somewhere mm. Right. And and these third party centralized services are the ones that provide the APIs, which is just one line of code. Uh, quite literally, it's just a URL that goes to their servers that they control with the full nodes that then uh, allow them to provide the data for the application that's building on Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it might be. Yeah, I apologize. I should have done my uh, more research on this, but I, yeah, I'm on their website, Ethereum that's and IPFS APIs. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, so, so now what, where are you guys with the project with pocket now in terms of, um, I don't know, kind of it's, it's, it's journey. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, to pick it back up in, in 2016, you know, we, we, we started writing smart contracts. We thought that pocket would be fine to be built as a set of smart contracts in Ethereum. We found out that Ethereum was, was incredibly expensive. Uh, uh, and we didn't want to be uh, kind of beholden to the gas costs that we see today. And that was even a problem back in 2016, 2017. Uh, so we went through kind of an iterative cycle where, uh, you know, we looked at like state channels, um, other constructions like plasma and these sorts of things, and then ended up deciding to build our own blockchain um, uh, uh, fundamentally. So, um, and we felt that was important because uh, this allowed us to be much more granular with the way that value was transferred uh, it allowed for the cost of the network to be significantly cheaper uh, to operate, at least in terms of um, uh, uh, raw compute and these sorts of things. So uh, we ended up building our own blockchain, designing it, uh, and, and so on and so forth, uh, and ended up launching it uh, almost eight months ago to the day uh, on, on July 28th of last year. So, so to take a step back, Pocket is a two-sided marketplace that connects developers building applications to a network of full nodes uh, uh, all around the world. Um, uh, so these are Bitcoin nodes, Ethereum nodes. Uh, uh, we support 11 chains today and expect to be supporting 20, 30, 40, 50 over the next um, couple of months, actually. So, so fundamentally, um, uh, uh, it's this marketplace that, that allows people to access data for their applications. And it's not... Um, oh, hey, use this because we're decentralized. Um, although the more you use it, the more, in fact, it incentivizes people to run more full nodes uh, because of the way it's designed. Um, it's actually better uh, uh, because it's cheaper and fundamentally much more private than, than in kind of our, our centralized counterparts. Uh, this is uh, fascinating. This is interesting to me, uh, mainly because like I've never, and maybe I'm just like under a rock or something, but I've never heard of, people trying to actually like monetarily incentivize node holders yet i think everyone recognizes yeah. that nodes are super important um yes so yeah, yeah. so from that and as like as someone who's built companies in this space i can definitely see um where something like this would come in and we're always thinking about you know like figuring out how to like decentralize a lot of uh, the different applications and so this is very interesting okay so anything else you want to share on on pocket or are we have we pretty much uh, covered most of the ground there yeah i suppose it's i suppose it's cheaper because it mm. completely removes the need for a centralized counterparty to kind of coordinate all this infrastructure for you uh, what makes it significantly cheaper is that no longer do you have a central company paying rent to aws and then also charging you know uh, their 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 rent to users to be able to make margins said so we have this trustless protocol that doesn't need to make any money uh, that actually coordinates this for users so so that's really why it's why it's Cause, cheaper cause, and i mean i mean like you know like it could be argued that you know maybe when ethereum initially started saying hey we need to decentralize everything maybe the argument wasn't as like needed or whatever. It was like, why? It's like, well, money needs to be decentralized. But today, you know, yeah. let's not go into any specifics here, but like, uh, I mean, censorship seems like the way, like I know and me doing this YouTube channel, like I don't say 80% of the stuff that I think because, <laughs> because I know it's, you know, it's going to get banned. Um, <laughs> but I also think about, I also think about, well, that's not 
no, that's not good, right? Like that's not normal. Like people should be able to say. So, so I, well, I guess what I'm getting at is, is like I think a lot about like how is YouTube gonna get decentralized? Like, is it gonna be? Um, I don't even know. Is there even a platform that that like lo- that's looking to decentralize video? Like I know Jack Dorsey's talking about even like you know decentralizing Twitter. Whether it's like I think Mastodon and some of these have looked at it, but like. But like, you know what I mean? It like, when is, when is, uh, so are you saying, I guess where I'm really getting at, are you saying that via pocket, there could be a future where, like I said, I'm running a Mac mini or like a series of them or a bunch of raspberry pies in the corner of my house or my basement or a cold room somewhere. And it's like, I'm not just like mining, which is kind of the outer reach for a lot of people, but like I could yeah. be servicing, um, you know, some guys watching a video on XYZ platform that's now somehow being, you know, I'm being incentivized because I'm running and like yeah. Bitcoin and Ethereum. And maybe it's like, is it like figuring out what's the most profitable in real time? No, none of that. Right. It's just like, I get to choose, like, I'm going to support the Bitcoin network or Ethereum network, but you could see it eventually it could, couldn't it like auto optimize around like okay right now you need to be serving the bitcoin network because it makes the most financial sense (laughs) it totally could um Mm -hmm. uh, and to your point about kind of these these um you know censorship resistant uh, you know for me it it, up until the last six months um the idea of the importance of pocket being decentralized uh hadn't been as prominent right and particularly with with a lot of the stuff we've seen over the last six months um uh we definitely uh, uh, are going to see, I think, with these unopinionated protocols, um, uh, a lot of you know people move towards that direction. Now, what I think is going to happen is that the um, policing and governance of these things is going to just move higher up the stack uh, because you know in the end, what's illegal is illegal in in whatever jurisdiction you're in. Uh, but at least right now, uh, we're going to, I believe, we will see um, a flocking more to these kind of truly censorship resistant and, and permissionless protocols where, you know, I can't get you know, deplatformed or censored or whatever it might be. Now, how that gets governed, how that gets managed in the future is an open question. I, I think it's inevitable that it will be. Uh, my question is where that gets governed, right? Whether it's kind of like in these, um, you know, at the base layer of a protocol, at the applications built on top of the protocols, right? Um, uh, there's just various layers of the tech stack that I think um, are kind of choke points. And, and in the end, I think society is going to have to come to consensus or agreement on, on you know, what should be allowed and, and, and what shouldn't on these sorts of things. But it's 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 really quite interesting. But and, and also to your point, um, you know, I, I, I see a future where in 10 years, my mom is running some full nodes, uh, allowing her access to, you know, Web3, something similar to probably her her Wi-Fi router, <laughs> you know, sitting right next there, right, right, right next to it, allowing me to communicate access all these different, you know, I, I believe just a flowering of decentralized protocols being built and um, uh, also making some money, right? Obviously by then it'll be, it'll be much more competitive, but, um, and I wouldn't expect this to be with, you know, proof of work, but uh, uh, just because of the, the economics of, of how it works, but fundamentally, I think there's a really big opportunity Cause, cause, to have. Because there's these, because um, like, I mean, you think of Amazon, you, you talked about AWS, right? Yeah. Like what an amazing service quite it possibly is. one of the biggest threats to like humanity right <laughs> um so so um so are you kind of suggesting that you know via these efforts like i said like your mom and my mom like 10 years from now everybody's just like you know as a little side uh, financial thing they're just running some computers that are you know essentially like nodes and they're but they're making some money for it type of deal um and, exactly. and they're also servicing they're serving bitcoin and, and you know whatever and if they're like passionate about you know um decentralizing video for example they are like the new youtube if you will or whatever you know because like, because it's them and like a million other you know people like them that are just like have computers and they're and they're but 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 the problem is it's never been economical it's never really made sense but i think a lot of people are now like whoa 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 i'm not even allowed to say what i want to say like that that's worth it to me to to go and you know whip up um my own bitcoin node my own you know what i mean like video service i don't know mastodon node or whatever whatever and so um so yeah uh anyways i think i think i think that makes a lot of sense that's really cool man um okay so just to, i guess anything else on, on on the pocket point before we i guess move on here no, I, guess, I suppose just to give you an update as where we're at today, mm. um, we got over 3,000 nodes uh, running on the network today. Um, uh, these are Bitcoin, Ethereum, a bunch of Ethereum test nets, and, and like I said, a bunch more in the future. Do about 5 to 10 million requests a day through the network for mm. production applications, so we're proving that it works and, 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 and is possible. 
uh, to incentivize people to run full nodes uh, for this explicit reason. And and yeah, that's a, a, a you know pocket pocket in a nutshell. That seems like a really amazing. I don't know. To me, at least, uh, it seems like an interest, very interesting project and uh, a noble cause. Because, like I said, you know, decentralization is uh, it's something that you know I think the world needs. It's not just like a nice to have anymore. Um, okay. Um, to get to my third question then, so which is, you know, what's one thing that you believe to be true that most others in, let's say Bitcoin would disagree with you on, because you did start this story with, uh, with Bitcoin, yeah. you know, and so now you ventured and now you have your own blockchain. So, you know, I can, you can, the heat's coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, how, how, what, what, what did you find? How did you finally see the light or whatever? Was it, I guess it was, it sounded like a little bit of it was ease of use and just like the welcoming nature of, uh, Ethereum in that world, right? Like it just is easy to program. That's what I heard at least. And then, and then you started seeing, you know, in the process of tinkering and your own journey, you started seeing real um, problems in the ecosystem that, um, that you felt needed to be addressed. Um, okay. So yeah. So I guess, so, so, so curious. So what, what, what's one, I don't know, maybe contrarian belief amongst all this or is something completely different? Yeah, um, I, I believe we're going to live in a world uh, mm. where there's going to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of blockchains governing our lives in the future. Uh, you know, how contrarian that is, uh, you know, I'm not sure. But but in my view, mm. uh, I think I think they'll be as common as 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 we see businesses and websites today. Um, and, and I think in many cases, it will actually be um, truthfully their own blockchains as opposed mm. to maybe applications built on on other blockchains specifically so uh so yeah that 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 would be my my roughly contrarian so you, so you hear it here yeah. you heard it here first sunny chain is going to become a thing <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm think we have. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no no i'm kidding no okay so yeah no i can i can kind of buy into that i mean like that's kind of like saying they're like maybe 30 years ago being like there will be more than one website <laughs> wow bold bold statement no to some extent i mean i know i i, I buy the whole bitcoin is the one right um but i think it's the one money i think it's the one money but i think i think i think uh yeah potentially right but i think i think uh blockchains and the idea of it will, will be used you know to, to solve if, other problems if i had a contrarian view about that i i, I probably would have said it but agree with you I, I i'm a little uh i'm a little concerned about the kind of proliferation of of stable coins in in some respects um mm. uh, being built on 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 some of these other platforms i'm curious to see how that plays with bitcoin um in the future uh just because we're seeing such massive growth in that but but frankly i i agree with you on that point so i i uh, uh at least um uh the, the 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 uh, main money, uh, I believe Bitcoin will be right. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um. Hey, curious. Are you are you at all into AI? Have you read any books? Have you tinkered with the technology? I don't know. Is it something you think about at all? I think about it at a very high level. Mm. Actually, I haven't had the time to to look into it as as deeply as uh, 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 as I've as as I've wanted to. Mm. Um, that said, uh, I think it's. Uh, so my view is is you know I don't know enough to give an opinion of of whether it's it's you know because you have really smart people on both sides of the coin, you know saying this is imminent danger or this isn't going to happen for 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 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Hmm. Um, but I do tend to agree with you know the need to uh, uh, make the tooling available for everyone, um, uh, regardless of 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 good or bad uses, uh, because I tend to generally believe that. Uh, uh, net, uh, good things tend to come of it. Uh, I think AI is a singular risk because you know there's a risk of of our you know Skynet overlords uh, kind of kind of changing everything and and us becoming their slaves. But I tend to lean towards the idea that these things should be open and these tools should be available for for anyone to use. I think we're seeing some really interesting things with GPT three, for example. Although it's a little problematic, it's not open source yet. Uh, we're starting to see, um, uh, and and at least I was going to ask you if we I, can run an open, if we can run a GPT three node. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll get there. You know, so I think Sam Altman um, said, you know, it, it, he 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 expressed, I, I suppose, the danger of of 
of opening that uh, too early, I suppose, which is kind of, uh, I don't know if hypocritical is the right word, but, but um, at least they've built an open platform or API for people to build on. And we're starting to see a, a flourishing of, of really interesting startups being built on that. But yeah, AI, it's a, it's a scary thing. I, I tend to lean towards, um, you know, uh, using these things to augment. I'm not so much in the um, cyborg camp, camp uh, at least on the, on the, uh, at least in the sense of, of completely replacing our humanity. Uh, I tend to, I tend to lean in the, let's try to augment our, our own, you know, monkey brains, uh, uh, because at this point it's a, it's an unstoppable, uh, uh, thing that, that, that's pretty difficult to, to, to quell at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, totally agree. Um, no, I was going to say is like, I, I've read books about it. I've spent some, actually I spent almost 10 years in robotics, uh, and there was quite a bit of AI oh. there, but not really. Um, but I would say the thing that scares me most about AI is once again, the centralization of data between behind, let's say five companies and two governments essentially control all of humanity's data. Yeah. To me, that's a bit freaky, right? And and I can't help but feel that in the future, you would need something or, or some group like yourselves that were incentivizing essentially decentralized AWS, right? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> Where, the thing, right? <laughs> uh, there's, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, all I was gonna say is, is that, and I think that would be um, a, a, like a noble way to mitigate this, this potential, like, you know, the negative elements of, of AI. Well, there's, there's two major kind of constraints there, right? It's, it's the data, the scale of the data to train these models and, mm. and the compute. Yeah, yeah, Only yeah. A handful of companies do have this compute and, and we've seen some early, I, I've yet to see, you know, you can think of Pocket as a compute network, but it's not generalized, right? It's, it's a very specific um, thing. Um, we've seen some attempts at some compute type protocols, but uh, we have yet to see anything that really uh, worked or has worked yet. I, I think. So when you say compute type protocol, you mean like protocols? Uh, wait, so Ethereum is not that it's programmable, but you're saying, uh, uh, oh, like a supercomputer or whatever, like an, an internet, like a blockchain that where you the input and the output are based on like where there's like some sort of computation that's done. Um, yeah, like like take a uh, take Kudo Miner for example. Uh, you know, it's mm. probably the most popular Ethereum mining software in the world. You know, they've managed to create a uh, a massive network of GPUs, all providing compute through for for Ethereum mining and a whole bunch of other things at this point, right? Now the question is, who's going to build the system that allows? you know, some, you know, group of scientists to train their models uh, without uh, uh, having to depend on, on um, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. Like I think, um, don't quote me on these numbers, but, but in the order of billions of dollars uh, uh, was paid to Microsoft because they're the only ones, one of the few that, that can offer the, the compute at scale that, 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 you know, GPT-3 needs, right? I think the project's called OpenAI, right? Um, you know, one day I hope that instead of depending on Microsoft for that, uh, there'll be some network that is incentivizing compute in a, in, yeah. a, in, a, in a, in a, novel way. And I think that's going to happen. Um, I have yet to see anything really that's, that's work. Cool. Mm, that's cool. That's an interesting idea. I know what you're but saying. But I could, yeah, I could mm, totally see that mm. happening. Yeah. Not relying on, you know, um, yeah. Satya Nadella not to be evil or whatever. Okay. So I was going to say is that I, um, Another uh, kind of like uh, trailing topic here is, is uh, that that uh, triggers a lot of people, but um, I'm kind of like off of it now, but this Ubi thing, uh, just curious if you have any any thoughts on just the general idea of universal basic income. Is it like the worst thing that could ever happen to humanity? Is it like, I don't know, is it like uh, necessary? You know, don't give a shit. Like where, where, where kind of are you? Yeah, yeah. In a... Uh, um... Yeah, with with UBI, it's 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 interesting. I I, I think in a in a perfect world, um, it'd be great. But but in reality, it's 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 not something that 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 is really going to work. Um, I, I think we have to find easier ways for people to have opportunities and and make money. And for me, that more than anything is 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 a bit of a of, of a UBI, right? Because part of the challenge, you know, and, and we see so much opportunity today, right, in, in, in crypto um, uh, because of the, you know, technical hurdles, right, you need to, to, to operate these things. And, and when you have a global UBI, it's like, well, all of a sudden it's 
made things much much easier for everyone and 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 you know unless it's it's unless it's possible to to have you know which which you know at least economically to, to have something that is is permanently inflationary uh, uh where people aren't dumping all the time like it's just it's i have yet to see a model that is sustainable in in a meaningful way um uh, at least for for ubi um for me it's 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 all about finding um creating more opportunities for more people uh more than more than anything uh at least at least in my view you said you got into bitcoin a long time ago so do you remember bitcoin faucets yeah absolutely what with, absolutely. with lightning and maybe some of the, maybe couldn't they just bring back bitcoin faucets like if you just needed to be you're like oh, i need like you know 30 cents point, to go buy some bread or something yeah i guess right then you'd have I mean, people gaming it being like oh some rich guy being like i need to make more of these like free bitcoins <laughs> yeah i mean you know I, at that at that global scale like at what point is it meaningful though like like mm. you know, like to, to, to create a meaningful you know thing for seven eight you know eventually 10 billion people you know how much that's a lot if it's 30 cents like that's that's a lot of money <laughs> mm. uh, uh how does that get spent how does that get managed it's it's really hard to to you know in, under what system right um how does that get recycled uh um yeah i think know, that, I, yeah yeah you're right there's probably more questions i think I don't think like a government led system could lead to what we want. Right. I think ultimately if you're taking from some and giving it to others, that's like, in my view, primarily like uh, what's it called um, immoral or whatever. And so I felt like something that was maybe based in like uh, philanthropy and yeah. Bitcoin or blockchain based. Right. So like the, the, the closest thing I've ever seen is something called good dollar by the guy who founded eToro, who I have a lot of respect for uh, Yanni. He was, the, he was, his name is on the white, the white paper for colored coins, you know, like the way back, like uh, the yep. first kind of, you could say attempt at doing what, what Vitalik and these guys are talking about, but I uh, have done rather. Um, but, but, um, but he's done something called good dollar where it's like an Ubi on the Ethereum blockchain and it takes profits from DeFi supposedly. I don't know. It works. It's a little bit of a, yeah. you know, interesting project, but, um, but that's the closest thing I've seen to it. Okay. Anything else you want to share in terms of like websites? I don't know, LinkedIn or not LinkedIn. Who does LinkedIn Twitter profile or whatever you want to share with people a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't think I've ever asked that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't really look at my LinkedIn yeah. much anymore. Yeah. We'll um, just put, throw up your resume here, do a little quick analysis. <laughs> like remember when yeah. resumes were a thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. No. Um, P-O-K-T network. Um, P-O-K-T.network. Super, super straightforward. Sweet. Um, that's where you can find us. We have a bunch of information, newsletters, so on and so forth. Pocket so. dot network, right? P O K T dot network, correct. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Sweet, man. Okay, so if there's nothing else, uh, Michael, I'll let you I'll bring this one to a close. Maybe just hang out for 10 seconds here. Um, but yeah, we're done here. Okay, so I'm going to stop. Cool.